This video is brought to you by the Hot Cider Patreon. Follow the link in the description to sign up today. It'll be some time before we know for certain whether 2023 was one of the greatest years in video games, but one thing for certain is that, critically, more highly rated games released in the past 12 months than the past 20 years. Following a slow recovery from Covid, and amidst one of the worst industry restructures we've seen so far, developers have gone against the odds and put out some of their best works, whether they're a seasoned AAA studio or first-time indie creator. With so many games released, shrinking the absolute best picks down to a list of just 10 has been a difficult prospect, even with the allowance of 5 extra silver medal winners. I haven't been able to play everything, so there are going to be some notable omissions from the list. And ironically, a few of these games I have covered previously on the channel. For more specific thoughts on those titles, I would seek those videos out. But for my choices, I've decided to prioritise the most novel experiences I've had this year. Although 2023 has been fantastic for new releases, it's also been one marked by iteration whether it's been sequels, remakes, or reworkings of existing games. Where possible, I've adjusted my choices to present you with something new, but I still consider all these picks amongst the best of the best. These choices will be presented out of order for the most part, as I rank each pretty much equally in how much I enjoyed them. So without further ado, here's the big D's for 2023. Or um, 2023's James of the Year. Uh, maybe let's call it 2023's Hottest Ciders. Before we get into the 10 proper, I'd like to shout out 5 games that nearly made the cut, and the reason that they didn't quite bring home the gold. First, commiserations to Pikmin 4, the grand return of Nintendo's Dandori action franchise 10 years after its previous grand return. It's a familiar experience, but one that's impossible to find beyond this one-of-a-kind series. Although it was nice to get more of what I liked, it was Pikmin 4's new additions I appreciated most. Ochi the dog is a mechanic I still think of often, a real versatile partner that can either work as a second captain akin to the previous two Pikmins, or can become a Yoshi-like steed that opens up new mechanics. Where difficulty has been reduced across the game, Ochi shifted the challenge of Pikmin 4 from not just doing the tasks as prescribed, but wanting to optimise myself to do better. Turning the world into more of a hub that can access dungeons and brand new activities like Dandori battles and challenges is a shift for the series I can get behind, letting me tune the difficulty exactly as I want it. I've always considered Pikmin something of an evolution from Super Mario 64, the same way that Yoshi's Island was from Super Mario World, increasing the challenge of solving a conventional obstacle course by adding some non-linearity and unit management and Pikmin 4 is maybe the game that makes that case the strongest. Another fantastic outing for the series then, even if it's in small increments. Second on the list and the most recent addition made is Sonic Dream Team. I'll cut to the chase. The only reason this hasn't qualified a little higher is because I'm waiting for a more comfortable way to play it. An Apple Arcade exclusive, you'd need to be rocking a newer iPhone model with a physical controller to play Sonic Dream Team at its best, and my hope is an eventual Switch or Steam Deck port can get this game into wider public attention. Because, like Sonic Mania was to the Mega Drive originals, Sonic Dream Team is a celebration of 3D Sonic that actually takes the lessons learned from his most successful games, adds a few new tricks, and then actually sticks the landing. There are linear runs that feel as solid as Sonic Dash, but the open areas that work like Tony Hawk's skate parks have become a perfect fit for the series. Unlike 2022 Sonic Frontiers that seemed to dilute its potential across too long a runtime, Sonic Dream Team is economical, keeping its fun short and broken up across multiple objectives like Super Mario 64. Maybe my favourite thing about Dream Team is that it feels as if Sonic's friends have their own unique ways to traverse levels, bringing back what was so great about Sonic Adventure 25 years ago. And for once, they have fantastic keyframed animation, avoiding that creepy football mascot look of Sonic Team's games. While I can't imagine any anyone from Sega is watching this channel, I'd like you watching to download this video, clip this part out, and send it en masse to their social media accounts to let them know that Sega Hardlight needs to be leading the charge on the next 3D Sonic game. And if that's too much to ask, please just release Dream Team more devices. 
The Making of Karateka is my third silver medal winner because it's not really a game, but it is precision tuned exactly to my tastes. I'm pretty hot on video game history, including the strides taken in keeping it preserved. I keep an eye on developments in FPGA emulation, evocades, and even work done by the Video Game History Foundation. While it is important to make sure that this work is still readily available, one of the challenges of game preservation is also making it easily digestible for a wanting audience. Projects like the making of Karateka have done exactly that. Building on Digital Eclipse's work done in Atari 50, this is a singular look at Jordan Mechner's pioneering title that laid groundwork for even more industry-shifting works. But it's the presentation of Karateka that I find so intriguing. When I'm not making thumbnails for your favourite YouTubers or trying to get my own videos out, I actually work in instructional design. Laying out information in a way that is not only intuitive but easy for a learner to retain is one of the biggest challenges I face, and so Digital Eclipse's work here is genuinely inspirational. They've taken whole years of materials and managed to construct them into a coherent timeline of events, where images, audio, video, and even playable game prototypes build up the story of Karateka. While I can't expect this level of treatment could be given to every video game, the making of Karateka raises the bar for every other publisher and IP holder in how they should present their video game history. Speaking of which, the fourth silver medal winner and the second game here by Nintendo is F-Zero 99. Following the removal of Pac-Man 99 and Super Mario Bros. 35, it's questionable whether this latest outing for Captain Falcon is going to be available this time in 2024, let alone the rest of the decade. I guess that's ironic for the 99 genre, where Fortnite's most significant financial successes are born from its inherent volatility, such as limited edition skins, ever-changing maps, and one-off mechanics. This is unfortunate, given that the Battle Royale's most captivating aspect is its enduring survival gameplay. It's you against 99 other players, as resources dwindle and safe havens become increasingly scarce. A quarter century prior to the rise of Fortnite, Nintendo's F-Zero series blazed the trail for a far more unique style of survival gameplay, transforming Formula One into a cutthroat and lethal competition. F-099 feels like the full realisation of this concept, replacing once docile AI with fierce human competitors, evoking the same thrills found in Fortnite or PUBG. It's an exhilarating experience, reminiscent of its Mo7 graphics and breakneck speeds left unchanged from the 1991 original. While there's better looking games in the series, none manage to encapsulate the essence of what makes F-0 as captivating as 99 does. So, while we could be awaiting the end of its racing season, there's no way I couldn't have included F-099 in the games of 2023 list. Finally, however, is a game that didn't release this year, but very much became a cultural phenomenon in the past 12 months. It's likely you know The Legend of Seeker by now, a goofy minigame made to demonstrate Japanese projectors that gained enormous popularity through VTubers before spreading across the world. It's a block action puzzle game, akin to Tetris and Puyo Puyo, where every dropped object works within a delicious collision system to create pop rock like antics. Although its Japanese Switch Online store version is what put the game on the map, and there are multiple HTML5 versions available online, my favourite take on the concept is Marble Merger, a Pico 8 clone made by 2D Array. Although it doesn't feature the smiling fruity faces of the original, it has been tuned and tweaked in such a way that combinations and collisions are just that much more satisfying. Its spartan but colourful presentation also mind casts me into thinking this was an arcade game from the 80s we missed out on, something that others would crowd around to watch the chaos unfold, whilst you felt like a master of manipulating physics, similar to a perfect game of pinball. I'm hopeful that the enormous success of Seeker Game is going to inspire a wave of developers to make their own arcade games, although it's more likely we'll see a thousand reskins of it for every popular device. Granted, Marble Merger's inclusion here is to make a point of keeping up with new Pico 8 releases, a platform that's still refreshingly modern, but whose limitations have led to new experiences that feel as if they could have existed during the height of the arcade boom. Now, on to my 10 gold medal winners of the year. 
I've previously covered Viewfinder, Chance of Sonar, Jassant and Cocoon in videos earlier this year. The former in comparison to Valve's Portal, and the latter three as demonstrations of great human-centric design. Without using the framework of those specific essays, I'd like to talk more generally on why I enjoyed them so much. They summed up the old adage of short and sweet. Each only took a few hours to fully complete, and were played pretty much as afternoon delights on random weekends. And yet, despite leaving almost as quickly as they arrived, they've continued to stick in my mind. I still can't stop thinking about how clever that camera is in Viewfinder, from how simple it is to point and shoot, and yet how much it fundamentally reworks how I think about traversing in 3D. Like the Portal Gun or Tony Hawk's Skateboard, it's a toy I want to use in every other video game world. Chance of Sonar is an adventure game where communication is the challenge, making me feel like this interloper who witnesses a society from afar before integrating myself in with game knowledge. It is video games to their bedrock, interpretation followed by execution. Jusant is Death Stranding for climbing, and especially when I think about how this year's Tears of the Kingdom seemed to totally minimise climbing with several other toys for traversal, I massively respect how Don't Nod's adventure knuckled down and focused on how much there is in the challenge of scaling rock faces. And then there's Cocoon, which honestly feels like one of those once-in-a-generation games like Journey, Inside, or Ico that has shifted my entire view on video games. It is breathtakingly massive in its concepts, and yet totally easy to grip when you play it. A singular adventure that covers more dimensions than any AAA release, and yet is still one you can beat in an average Marvel movie runtime. As I hope this illustrates, all four of these games totally thrive on their elevator pitches. A camera that can change the environment, a game about translating alien languages, one about traversing an impossible tall tower, and then one about worlds within worlds. None of these titles might have stood to scrutiny in enormous campaigns, but then neither do the standardised mechanics we take for granted. Shooting, combat, racing. These four use their budgets to not do a little over a long time, but instead do a lot in a little. Time is a precious commodity, and as I've gotten older, it's made me realise that I prefer these small and sweet experiences more than ones I have to soak a huge chunk of time into. A segment of my previous Alien Games essay delved into the Xbox Live Arcade era, and how it allowed smaller titles previously locked out of retail to reach a wider audience, and how in the years since platforms like Xbox Game Pass made games like this a more appealing purchase. For years, I had always thought that Microsoft's subscription scheme would only be viable the moment it had a blockbuster game that could compete with the likes of Sony's first party offerings, but as Netflix has proven with its unseasoned action vehicle, that's not why people subscribe to platforms like this. First it was for old favourites, but soon shifted to unique TV series that traditional networks had little interest in supporting. The success of Game Pass is in how it has allowed these smaller games to thrive, without them having to pad out their length to justify price, nor implement mobile-like monetization. I'd be interested in knowing how much I remember these four games come 2024, but I want them to inspire other games like them in future. I've often thought that some of the best modern indie games usually take one or two single mechanics from a AAA release and build entire robust experiences around them, and I wonder if that could go both ways. As enormous games become more safe and amidst to try and recoup their development costs, they should look at the success of smaller indie titles like this to, once again, innovate. Diversity has become something I've coveted more in games as the years have gone by, because I've been experiencing these same old ideas the longer I've been alive. That said, I haven't really got a problem with iterating on old ideas, as the rest of this list is going to prove, but a good video game diet requires more than familiar favourites. It's something I've discussed with a few different video makers the past few months, and it's been a hot topic this year as many YouTubers are trying to find answers to why so many huge AAA titles have seemingly failed to connect. The one for more variety has led many to go back to older titles, which is totally understandable, even if good old days rhetoric often gets co-opted by nationalist grifters. 
I think much like the four previous gold medal winners I mentioned, it proves that eras like the PlayStation often had more variety because there was less money being pumped into games, and so creativity had to be born from finding unique opportunities, similar to what many indies are doing today. For example, the enormous success of the Boomer Shooter category has less to do with the fact that these games look and play like Quake and Duke Nukem did, but more that they're throwbacks to experiences we don't really get anymore and still have an appetite for. But there's also plenty of fresh experiences that have come out of this movement, like Ultra Kill and El Paso Somewhere. All of this is to say, then, that one of my favourite games of the year deals very much with exposing myself to a world I've never experienced in my life, because it is the digital life story of one very unlike mine. Venber follows a family that immigrated from Tamil Nadu to Canada in the 1980s. As their first generation son acclimates quickly to this new environment, they do what they can to instill a sense of their culture in him. Much of this is done through teaching him how to cook fabulous dishes of their country, and that you as a player are involved in the assembly of. As the years go on, the original cookbook these dishes are made to becomes more damaged, and so you have to rely on the recollections of the family's mother to fill in the gaps. It is gameplay as metaphor, that in order to keep our traditions alive, we must practice them regularly and share them with others. Venber is mechanically a simple game, and calls to mind the mobile adventure game Florence that also used simple gestural inputs to have the player conduct a life story, tying them into every emotional beat. Venber does likewise, and while not all of us can say we've experienced a story like the one of its family, we can completely empathise with their situation through play. Lamhoot, one of my video making friends, has recently put out a curated mixtape that has collated a number of video essays about creators' relationships with food. I had actually been invited to contribute something to it, but I never really figured out an idea in time. I think it's because I don't really have much of a relationship with food. It's more of an amicable working partnership. My initial essay for this mixtape was looking into me being a picky eater as a kid, and how in the years since I've attempted to make up by eating as many different things as I can. The idea never quite gelled for me though, and was probably because it was an idea that my older sister had come up with. Someone who has a far more robust relationship with cooking and food preparation than I have. But in hindsight, I realised that my shift in eating habits is exactly what happened to my video game tastes in turn. I went from being incredibly insular in my likes to trying to play anything I could expose myself to. Part of growing up was learning to embrace a lot of the food groups that made up Welsh and broadly British cuisine, much of which has been stolen from the many colonies the Empire occupied over its rule. This has included anglicised versions of Goan and South Asian cuisine, which features heavily in Venba. My local versions of this food is delicious, but I'm always aware that it's been adjusted for a different palate. It's similar in turn to how games have to make sometimes abstract concepts familiar to a player. In that respect, then, Venber is less a playable cookbook and more playable history. The role-playing game has existed longer than the computer, and yet they always play out in adventures where you become the most idealised version of yourself. Venber, on the other hand, wants you to empathise with someone else entirely, by interacting with them. AAA games of a certain kind now resemble the same old McDonald's Big Macs year on year, food that no matter which franchise you go to, is always going to be familiar and not particularly fulfilling after the fact. And sure, you could make a video about why the Big Macs you liked as a kid were better because you weren't so familiar with them, and rather than reflect on that, instead pin the blame on people you don't know. But I don't know, perhaps you might feel more satisfied if you decided to experience something you've never had before. It might be a little spicy, or the texture is a bit odd, but you never know, you might end up discovering your new favourite dish, and want to explore an entirely new world of cuisine that came out of it. In the case of Ember, you may even find a connection to a wider world world you didn't know existed. So, bon appetit. As the Game Awards of the past weeks have proven, there is still an insatiable appetite amongst critics and audiences alike for role-playing games that throw back to a specific era of computing. Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't just improve on Larian's previous work with the Divinity series, but it's also a welcome return of Dungeons & Dragons back into mainstream RPGs. It's also a game that, as of this video's upload, I haven't actually played. My plan is that, in the quiet early period of 2024, I'll finally sit down and play this landmark release. But I don't exactly have a fondness for this era of RPGs, because I was a tiny baby with a Macintosh when they were released. 
but a type of RPG that I am very fond of is the Game Boy Advance era of action-driven roleplayers. Games like Mother 3 and Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, where often mini-games and timing challenges took the place of random chance, making these often static battles more interesting. I've previously spoken about my fondness for the GBA era of games when I looked at Summit Sphere's Ant on Board Lux, which perfectly encapsulates the colour palettes, crunchy sound samples, mixed media graphics, and even throwback gameplay of its time. A counterpart to this release that gives a Wario-like flair to the role-playing game is Andrew Brophy's Knuckle Sandwich. I've been waiting for this game for a long time, having backed it on Kickstarter some years ago and getting a nice pin badge from my patronage, and I'm happy to say that Knuckle Sandwich was worth the wait, and while it hasn't yet totally surprised me, it has at least completely met my expectations. I suppose I should quickly explain why, as it's likely this is the one game on the list you haven't actually heard of. The most appealing elevator pitch for Knuckle Sandwich is this. Imagine an RPG in the vein of Earthbound, but one where combating enemies plays out via WarioWare microgames. For example, defending against a ghost plays out as a DDR-like button response game, whilst laying on enormous damage is a matter of wildly mashing buttons to build a power meter. In WarioWare fashion, these micro-challenges quickly flash a prompts and controls, and then give you a few seconds to intuit and act on them. Even the standard battling requires player input, whether it's landing in the safety area of an action bar, or hitting prompts at the exact right time. I've never been a fan of the abstract menu battling of traditional RPGs, and so Knuckle Sandwich is exactly what I've always wanted, because it turns those actions into abstracted minigames instead. WarioWare isn't just felt in the gameplay of Knuckle Sandwich, but also its aesthetics. There are times the look of the game shifts to either Game Boy Color-like palettes and renderings to evoke earlier time periods, but also flashes of DS-era 3D with flattened shading to give an otherworldly feel. One of my favourite boss fights in the game even uses pre-rendered clay models, a shift from the usual and very well-crafted sprite work. It's a feast for the senses then, including its incredibly funky battle music that I still find myself grunting along to when I've put the game to rest. Knuckle Sandwich is built on novelty, both for better and worse. While I haven't quite gelled with its plotline, I do at least like the delivery of its story and am intrigued by where things will develop further. It's clever that a fable about the somewhat random and unfair nature of trying to find and maintain a job as a adult is rendered through obtuse and rapid fire minigames. I haven't completed Knuckle Sandwich yet, but I don't think I'm quick to put it on my game of the year list, even if it's possible it may be completed in 2020. Four. Sometimes you just know early on if a game is or isn't going to be your thing, and I'd be surprised if Knuckle Sandwich dramatically shifts in content before the credits call. That said, there have been a few unexpected shifts so far, which has kept me engaged in seeing what comes next, but it's that sheer variety of combat microgames that has me coming back for more. I'm always thrilled to experience the zany and unexpected collection of microgames of a new WarioWare, and it's very cool to see this concept expanded into a more fulfilling adventure. Much like 2021 Spookware, I'm excited to see how a concept like this could be translated to other genres in the future. Speaking of uh, Warrior Likes, 2023 has been a fantastic year for platform games of all stripes. On the most independent end, we had the full release of Pizza Tower, and unexpectedly on the AAA side, we also received a brand new 2D Mario game, Super Mario Bros. Wonder. I've covered both games previously, and in the case of Pizza Tower, even gave my full review of it. So I suppose then this will be more of a look into how they summed up this year in side-scrolling, high-jumping action. What both games had in common was the full exorcism of timers, an embrace of exploration, turning what used to be a straightforward obstacle course into slower and more thoughtful worlds to fully navigate. That's not to say that the timers were completely gone, however. It was just up to the player when and how they activated. Pizza Tower, of course, develops on Wario Land 4's escape sequences by turning every trip back to the entrance into an anxiety-driven nightmare. While Super Mario Wonder throws reality into chaos every time a player picks up a Wonder Flower, these mechanics work on a similar concept, taking levels that a player will have stewed in for minutes and then completely upending them by changing their rules, finding novelty once again in now familiar levels. There are also games that challenge the conventional look of a platformer by breaking away from current trends. 
Sonic Superstar, for example, had the familiar 3D models that have been part of the series since generations, creating a game that doesn't quite have the artistic intent that Mania managed to achieve some years ago. Nintendo then smartly pushed the rendering of 3D models further than before, taking out frames of animation and focusing on strong keyframes so 3D movement had even more impact. It's something that Pizza Tower totally excels at, with a scratchy MS Paint look that economically focuses on the strongest keyframes possible. But why both have stuck in my mind and won Golden Awards for 2023 is because they did give me something unique, despite being indebted to older Nintendo games. The developers of Pizza Tower are understandably keen for their title to not be so directly compared to Wario's greatest achievement, and honestly, this final release does manage to shake off those comparisons. Sure, the escape sequences did find their origins in that title, but Tour de Pizza go even further with the concept than Nintendo ever achieved. Entirely new adventures play out in these secondary escape sequences, often introducing brand new mechanics that all build towards that sense of manic anxiety. It's like that old saying, good artists copy, great ones steal. The Pizza Tower developers aren't indebted to copying Nintendo because they did it first, because these folks did it even better. The same goes for gross out animations and level concepts that have broken entirely away from what Nintendo would have allowed on the GBA. It's not really a surprise that the fan base is now quick to call any anything remotely similar, a Pizza Tower clone, due to just how strong of an identity is created for itself. Although I'm pretty sure that these new games are going to quickly distinguish themselves once they hit a full release. As for Super Mario Bros. Wonder, it managed the impossible of making me interested in a 2D Mario game again. Part of why I always found Wario or even Yoshi more appealing is because I like their more exploratory, objective-driven gameplay, something that the obstacle course Mario games never had, at least until they transformed into 3D. As the first Mario game to take inspiration from these open-world games, Mario Wonder channels that same magic and reaps the benefits of it. And sure, while I sing the praises of how great is strand game design is in its own video essay, Mario Wonder could have succeeded if it was a totally single player experience, just on the strength of its own novelty. It's going to be a tough feat for Nintendo to outdo themselves with the next one, if they decide that making a direct sequel to Wonder is even the right call. Maybe I might even be so lucky that they take inspiration from their indie competition and decide to bring back their own subversive platform star back into the starlight. Maybe the most controversial question to be answered in 2023 is this. Is Resident Evil 4 a better game than Resident Evil 4? Earlier this year, I delved into the original RE4 in a detailed retrospective, a project that had been in the works long before the remake was officially announced. To summarise that video, it's a title that was shaped by the circumstances of a drawn-out development, the flagging popularity of RE, but also opportunities of third-person shooters at the time. Given this context, a remake that couldn't recreate those conditions appeared destined to just be a decent imitation. I'm happy to say then that the Resident Evil 4 remake is easily one of the standout games of the year, managing the impressive feat of reinventing a game I knew down to its code. However, there had been a little asterisk next to that success. It hadn't replaced the original, but rather engaged in a kind of dialogue with it, a fantastic tribute act that didn't eliminate the need for the 2005 classic. To be maybe slightly less flattering to it, RE4 did what the RE2 remake had achieved a few years earlier, using the design framework of Resident Evil 7 as the basis for this new adventure, down to its more Metroid-like hubs and key-driven adventure game design. In that respect, Resident Evil 4 2023 pairs well with 2021's Resident Evil Village. Both are attempts at combining the appeals of the original RE4 with RE7 together, and this newer game might be the more successful result just in terms of sheer content. One of the set pieces I think fondly of in the base remake of RE4 is Del Largo's Lake Arena, which has now been transformed into a hub that connects to almost all parts of the village, with an objective that expects actual backtracking in order to push forward. But the thing is, this lake was always somewhat explorable in the original RE4, but never necessary to complete the full game. It is in microcosm then what makes the RE4 remake great, but not totally transformational. It shows just how much content there was in the original 
the Kilfa from, and in putting that content so in our faces now, it feels far less confident than that now 18 year old game was. But then, something unexpected occurred that completely reshaped my view of the entire Resident Evil 4 remake, to the extent that it might now be my most preferred way of experiencing RE4. One aspect I overlooked in my retrospective of 2005's RE4 was an addition that came in a later release, separate ways. Casting players in the role of secret agent Ada Wong, the scenario was a means to provide a different perspective on the unfolding story and fill in some gaps. Ever wondered why the bell rang during the initial village onslaught? No? Well, it turns out that Ada rang it to come to Leon's rescue. Wow. To put it kindly, the original Separate Ways felt a bit underdeveloped, aside from the addition of Ada's grappling hook, which allowed players to access some new areas, it was essentially a watered down version of the original RE4 campaign, lacking the variety and thrills that made it one of the greatest adventures in games. So I found it shocking that Separate Ways underwent an even more radical transformation in Resident Evil 4's remake. It has evolved into a campaign that, in my opinion, is as equally substantial as Leon's. This now means that RE4, following Resident Evil tradition, includes two campaign leads embarking on their own individual journeys through the same story. Not everything was fully adapted back into Leon's campaign, and while it was disheartening to see certain scenes and concepts left out, they hadn't been entirely discarded. Instead, they had been seamlessly reimagined within its campaign. One of the most notable omissions from the remake was a scenario where Leon battled a mutant creature whilst chasing after Ashley. It seemed to appear somewhat randomly between two other boss fights, exemplifying how Resident Evil 4's original design was a patchwork of various concepts from failed iterations. However, in Ada's campaign, this boss has been fully integrated, appearing right from the start and naturally tracking her throughout the adventure, reminiscent of Nemesis in the third Resident Evil game. The boss takes a prominent role in much of the storytelling within separate ways, providing a substantial backstory for Ramon Salazar's Left Hand Maiden, a character who, in the original game, makes a brief appearance and then departs with little recognition. In separate ways, she steps into the spotlight, serving as a contrasting shadow to the equally skilled Ada Wong. The initial confrontation that kicks off this campaign between Ada and the Handmaid leads to eerie supernatural hallucinations that seamlessly reintroduce elements from the original RE4 Hookman demos. Almost every aspect of the monster's inclusion offer glimpses of Capcom's accomplishments with this remake, not just a reimagining of the original RE4, but even the stuff that got left on the cutting room floor. Combined with separate ways then, Resident Evil 4 2023 is a total celebration of Resident Evil 4's 2005's underlying potential, letting it finally be the game it could have always been. Even embracing a more standard control scheme allows the remake to be far more playful in a way the original never could be. Leon is far more of a ninja here when dealing with villagers, whilst Data can even use a grappling hook in combat to close distances. It's honestly just a lot more fun to play this new take on RE4. Even even if I haven't built up the mental routines that I have from playing the original for so many years. So is Resident Evil 4 better than Resident Evil 4? Mm, well, obviously everyone has their own answer, but I think this 2023 remake managed the impossible of outdoing what was a perfect game. Not because it's somehow more impossibly perfect, but it's far more experimental and playful than I ever imagined it could be. In a year that has been marked by small iterations, deciding to go this far out with the concept has been massively appreciated. The far more controversial Resident Evil 5 and 6 then seem like absolute layups for remake considerations. Granted, the newer Resident Evil games have yet broached multiplayer cooperation, but I have full trust that these developers will be able to knock it out of the park. Of course, I'm far more excited to see what the next chapter in the series is going to look like. Although it was a game I played this year, I'm not going to include The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom as a gold medal winner, although in regards to its technical achievements, it is incredibly deserving of that award. However, I would like to quickly talk about an inclusion in the game I absolutely adore, and one that I hope the next Zelda game could take some inspiration from. One place that Breath of the Wild could have improved was the shrines, those miniature dungeons dotted across Hyrule that provided short bursts of puzzle-solving action. They were a bit too bland, somewhat random, and often too annoying for their own good. Tears of the Kingdom fixes these issues… 
For the most part, while I haven't solved every single challenge the game has, I've done enough to say that I haven't noticed anything as irritating as the combat challenges of that first game. But one challenge type I've fallen in love with are the Proving Ground tasks. A favourite shrine from Breath of the Wild for many and myself was Link's trip to Eventide Isle, where for an extended excursion, players were completely stripped of their inventory and asked to start again from nothing. The island was a test of everything the player had learnt so far, and an opportunity to become reacquainted with those chemical and physical reactions forgotten about when more optimal solutions became available. It was a demonstration of the power games have when players have to begin from nothing, similar to a roguelike where the only experience a player can carry forward is their own game knowledge, making them feel all the more satisfied when that application results in positive feedback. So what a delight it was that Tears of the Kingdom brought back the Eventide Isle, but turned it into multiple shrines, focused on solving a single challenge each time. For a few moments, the Proving Grounds turned Tears of the Kingdom into miniature games of Metal Gear Solid, where the cubic designs of these rooms and the Zonai-powered guards following strip troll patterns evoke the mechanics of Hideo Kojima's stealth action series. Stripped to only your hearts and stamina, and asked to procure weapons on sight, you can only rely on your powers of intuition to complete the shrines, and those brand new Ultra Hand powers you've had all game. Where I often felt as if these abilities weren't well utilised in the open world, I feel like a creative genius using them in these proving ground challenges, snatching items from a distance and fusing new weapons together. It shows just how much creativity can be birthed from limitation. Outside of these shrines, Tears the Kingdom suffers from a blow of far too many options. Something that friend and fellow video maker Harry from Video Games of Bad summed up well in his own video on the Zelda sequel. Much like MGS5 The Phantom Pain struggled with, even Nintendo can't balance the game to make you feel as if you have to use every option, and the cost of getting the most optimal weapons and items turns the game into a boring grind. The Proving Ground shrines don't have this issue because you cannot bring the outside in with you. These are completely tailored challenges, and ones that Nintendo absolutely excel at. In that regard, I almost wonder whether the next Zelda outing could apply this design throughout the entire game. I mean, if Super Mario Wonder can drop the timer and even minimise lives as a concept, why can't Zelda make inventories less of a priority, and instead tailor Link's loadout around each dungeon? Players will still build up experience the more they play with Link and the more challenges they face, still fulfilling the role-playing aspect of this action-adventure game. I guess maybe then not for the sequel of Tears of the Kingdom, but a smaller and streamlined title akin to Wonder could be the perfect opportunity to see how far this concept could be taken. Finally, and maybe my shortest recommendation of the video, but my first place winner this year goes to From Software's Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon. I have covered this game in a previous video, and so I just want to focus entirely on why, of every other game released this year, and those spoken so kindly of in this video so far, how does this game manage to get its first place position? Well, ultimately, Armored Core 6 was the game of 2023 for me. Something completely unexpected, totally wanted in the moment, and has since affected my thoughts on every game I've played since. Elden Ring is to many the best game that games could possibly be. A colossal fantasy world where RPG mechanics allow a true sense of expression, and dark fantasy difficulty makes every obstacle overcome more satisfying. For me, Elden Ring was just big Dark Souls, an experience I didn't like when it was smaller and felt increasingly alienated by once mainstream consensus considered it the template other games should follow. Not to be reductive, of course, especially if Elden Ring is your cup of tea. But Elden Ring exemplified 2022 for me, a year where many of my favourite games came out of the sparkling independent development scene, because AAA was focused on reiterating familiar experiences. What a shock and delight then that the development studio responsible for the game I considered my nadir could also produce something that was so in tune to everything I could potentially like. Not a fan of dark fantasy and cryptic lore? Well, here's a science fiction story where huge companies use mechs to fight proxy wars. Hey RPG grinding, well this game is all about building a robot out of parts with distinct pieces you get for pretty much completing short levels. And hey, level's too big? Well, these ones are too, but you fly around at supersonic speeds, so hey, 
When I talked about Armored Core earlier in the year, I wanted to confirm that I didn't like the game because it was the opposite of Elden Ring, but rather that its tweaks to the formula finally got me to appreciate what From Software did so well. I understood the challenge of its balletic boss fights when I wasn't sent back to a fireplace and lost all my souls, but instead could just quickly reload and hop back in. I could soak in the writing, both in the item descriptions and what was broadly spelled out, when it was delivered through this more modern tone. And I could appreciate From's fascination with genre when they finally tackled a genre I like. I'm trying to be better in widening my taste in games, but sometimes I do need a taste of the familiar in order to make a greater leap. But compared to every other game I've played this year, Armored Core 6 has a sense of speed and action that nothing has quite been able to compare to. Even the few racing games I put a lot of time in, and those didn't run quite as well on my PC as From's very optimised game did. In fact, playing Armored Core 6 did get me to explore other titles like it, and while earlier games in the series didn't quite win me over, it did get me to fall for the action arena games that it riffs on. In particular, Roll 7's Rollerdrome, which feels like a low fidelity take on Armored Core by swapping out supersonic mechs for women on roller skates with shotguns. At this point, I'm fully locked in to play whatever the new Armored Core game is going to be, but more importantly, I'm going to check out any game that takes either full or some inspiration from it. While I may have been disheartened in calling Elden Ring the game of 2022, I'm happy to say that From have done it again and produced quite easily the game of 2023. It might be the newest entry in their longest running franchise, but it's one that is completely unlike anything else I've played before, and certainly unlike anything else I've played this year. And sure, novelty isn't always going to be a sign of quality, but From Software have never faulted in making a game anything less than a game of the year contender. This is going to be my last video of the year, but not my last video of 2023. In the new year, I'll be releasing a companion video where I've asked some of my video making friends about their favourite games the past 12 months. If you're new to the channel, please make sure you're subscribed so you'll be notified when that video goes live. Until then, however, an enormous thank you to everyone who supported me the past 12 months, especially those on the hot side of Patreon who fund the production of everything I work on including this video. And a huge thank you to you watching, whether you're a long time subscriber or a first time viewer. I hope to see you again in the new year and hope you have a wonderful end to 2023.